Hi, hello everyone. I'm Andre. I'm from Romania. I'm 22. I think I'm the youngest guy from here, so have mercy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm not going to show you how uh, things going in Romania because uh, I can briefly explain to you this thing in just words. It doesn't. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. There are several things happened right there. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, honeypots, offensive honeypots, and uh, what you can do and how they, uh, these things are important for us. Uh, this is the summary, short bio into the honeypots world, why they matter, type of honeypots, uh, and uh, after that we'll talk about uh, the offensive approach and or the proactive approach of um, this kind of tools. And at the end, we'll talk about, uh, we have some conclusions uh, regarding all these things. So my name is Andrea Vadeni. I'm the president of the Cybersecurity Science Center from Romania, an organization that mostly uh, focus on um, research development of kind, uh, all varieties of tools uh, in the cybersecurity fields, and uh, also on education. I run uh, two conferences, uh, one monthly called Sparks, and the second one, <laughs> It's called DEF Camp. Uh, it's an international hacking and security conference with uh, almost 400 attendees last year from 20 countries. Uh, and uh, this year we expect over 500 uh, attendees coming to Romania in Bucharest uh, at the end of November. So if you are inter interested in uh, talking at this conference, I can uh, show you right now that uh, um, the call for paper starts at the end of April. So if you want to bypass the call for paper submissions, just give me a sign. <clears throat> so what's, what uh, is uh, Honeypot uh, this day? Well, according to Wikipedia, Honeypot is a trap set to detect and uh, deflect in some, in some manner uh, attempts of uh, unauthor unauthorized uh, attacks. Well, uh, often honeypots are mis, uh, misguided, mis, uh, are found in IDS products. So most of the features found in, that are found in a honeypot are uh, easily integrated in IDS and IPS uh, products. Uh, don't think, uh, don't think uh, as honeypots as um, full security measure, measure because it's just another layer of security. So take into account, but don't take this as your only approach in this field. Why they matter? Because they collect little data, and uh, all this data have a really high impact on uh, deciding what you have to do in the following uh, years or, or what you have to implement to get a better protection in this field. Uh, usually they don't need uh, much resources for integrating in your own infrastructure. There are no fancy algorithms, no signature databases to maintain, no rule base uh, to misconfigure, so it's kind of easy to implement all this kind of open source. Uh, there are really cool open source uh, honeypots uh, available, so you just have to install these kind of tools. Uh, you can prevent the, the attacks before they, they really happen. So this is mainly the best reason you have to take in account. You can catch all days and one day uh, exploits uh, just uh, targeting your uh, uh, your critical infrastructure. So you have practically better, better security. So there are three main uh, types of honeypots. The low interactions such as HoneyD or KF sensor. Uh, medium interaction, Kipo, Spectre, and so on. And uh, I got an example for a high interaction uh, honeypot called HoneyNet. I'm not sure if it's still live right now, but uh, at, their, at the, the ta their time, he was really good. So high interaction honeypots are those kind of honeypots that uh, are built in uh, how to put this uh, down? Uh, they are built on uh, fully environment or architectures, and uh, they might be both defensive and uh, offensive. Uh, they may have both defensive and offensive approach. So back to our proactive honeypots. 
um, I think that most of you guys are agreed that uh, best uh, approach to defense your company or organization is an offensive approach. Uh, this technique is mainly used in the football, so why shouldn't use it in our uh, infrastructures? Uh, offensive honeypots are, as I said, uh, high interaction honeypots, but their main purpose is to reveal the source of an attack. You, you have the best timing uh, uh, when uh, an attacker tries to hack your infrastructure because when he, are, he tries to attack your your um, your computers and your network, they are the most vulnerable. They don't uh, expect to counterattack and uh, gather, in t uh, gather information about regarding him and uh, so on. So you should build a multi-layer fingerprint honeypot uh, based on how aggressive is the hacker because um, if uh, somebody just tried to hack your website, I think uh, most of the time you don't have many information for example, in Romania, most of the uh, government uh, website doesn't have any kind of uh, personal data and so on. So hacking the, pres the president website doesn't get you nothing more than a, a Hall of Fame uh, position. Okay, so some key points about uh, offensive honeypots. Uh, they get you more intelligence, they get you more finger, they can help you to fingerprint the attacker, they, they can help you to make some profiling about uh, the hacker that targets your infrastructure. Uh, so uh, you can also make the reverse penetration because basically you, you can help, you can do whatever you want as a, as a security guy. Uh, just like a hacker does, so it's kind of easy. The motivation, uh, Alexei from Russia in 2011 uh, implemented an aggressive trap, uh, but it was a really easy honeypot. I mean, uh, he just uh, uh, attacked the, um, the hackers that are trying to hack uh, only that are trying to penetrate his website based on secure injection. So basically, uh, he only uh, react on uh, on the on the time where uh, where the hackers are trying to exploit this this kind of uh, vulnerability. And uh, when he detect that, he basically inject a Java applet into the request that uh, was made. So the experiment concluded a rate of 37% of reverse penetration. That means that uh, he got more, uh, he got 37 more accurate data than you have right now. So basically, uh, you're, you, should, you should think about uh, implementing this kind of tools. 37% for just a simple SQL injection. I mean, in a login form, so <laughs> kind of uh, cool. Also, there are ethical issues around this uh, field, mostly because in most of the countries, you cannot use in court uh, this kind of information of obtained by offensive approach, such as hacking the computer of the hacker or fingerprinting and so on. But uh, I hope and I feel that uh, this thing will, will change in the following years. So we should consider building this kind of tools based, on, of course, on hackers' tools, because uh, why should I reinvent the wheel? So the first example, I have two examples. One is about the, how you can uh, fingerprint and uh, find out uh, who the hacker is, uh, is on the web. And the second one is on your network or the infrastructure behind you. Uh, yeah. So uh, basically you can uh, use all kinds of uh, browser-based and plugin exploits for fingerprinting, such as uh, vulnerabilities for Java PDF, uh, plugins such as LastPass that stores all your password in theoretically in client, in client side, but there are also some vulnerabilities around there. Uh, social network, you can use all kinds of auto, auto clicker to, to find who the, who's the guy behind the, the attack, because when he tries to, um, how to put this, uh, when he tries to uh, attack your website, usually he will use a, a classical browser such as Chrome or Firefox, and uh, there's the timing, the best moment when you, you can find out who is who's the guy behind. So uh, 
using uh, so taking in account that most of the hackers does forget to uh, sign out from the social networks or from their emails you can use vulnerabilities in this kind of uh, social uh, websites to find out who's the guy behind uh, also another cool thing that you can make when uh, a guy tries to visit your website is an internal port scanning or um, uh, access to the uh, to his router so basically if you have a, a wide list of uh, vectors that attacks um, his um, his routers uh, maybe you can have a chance to exploit and bypass uh, his viral restriction to log in, in that uh, router and to maybe to to upgrade his firmware with your backdoor firmware and so on and so on so there are many cases uh, that you can use uh, situation that you can use for finding who the guy is behind the the browser Another example is to use persistent cookies. For example, if today he enters on your website with uh, uh, Tor or any kind of VPN, maybe tomorrow he doesn't. So if you have a persistent cookie set on his browser, in the second day you'll find that cookie and uh, voila, you find the guy behind the IP. <clears throat> Another thing to take into consideration is to make that uh, honeypot as real as possible because uh, you'll uh, if you have the guy longer in your website, you'll probably have enough time to fingerprint and to use all kind of uh, tools integrated in your honeypot. So try to keep him as long as possible in your attention. Uh, the second uh, case study is the network. Uh, there are two situations or two kind of uh, approaches. One is to backdoor all your documents that you store on, uh, <laughs> on your uh, computers from your internal network. This is not so good because uh, anybody can open that documents and you might infect your own boss. So uh, I'm not sure it is the right approach. And the second approach, are, uh, it might be the, uh, the creation of a trap, uh, an, uh, a trap server, in fact, that acts as a honeypot. When somebody enters or exploits that uh, honeypot and tries to, to escalate it, uh, all uh, all the security measures that uh, are around that uh, trap, you can uh, intercept all the traffic that's come in and get out from that uh, server. And uh, I don't know, you can uh, backdoor all the documents that he tries to download from other servers throughout the, uh, the trap. Or you can uh, inject uh, in PDFs, uh, binary files, and so on. Uh, it's important to try to act as real as possible because most of the hackers will catch you and they, they'll find that uh, that uh, application is a trap. So try to use real documents, try to use, uh, uh, to use uh, real data because it's, it's really easy to know, mostly if the, tar the hacker is uh, trying to uh, act as a target, uh, have a target in mind, he will probably know inside information. So if he ha if he don't find the uh, if he doesn't find the that information, he will he will probably uh, get out uh, faster than you want. <clears throat> this is our work and status. First stage is developing and uh, uh, all these scen scenarios. Second is building some unit testing and check results. We are now at integ integrating uh, into a real product a critical infrastructure back in Romania. So after that, we will analyze uh, these uh, uh, results, and after that, we'll uh, try to scale and build a product with this. As a conclusion, conclusion um, uh, from my point of view, honeypots are a really great thing to, uh, and, uh, regarding to that data gathering. Uh, although offensive honeypots have some ethical issues, uh, you should take into consideration uh, as a future measure to counterattack counter all these kind of attacks. Uh, the closer you are to, the, to your product environment, the better results you'll get. And uh, um, don't forget that offensive uh, honeypots is a cybersecurity field that is not clearly documented yet. I hope that in the following years we'll see more application uh, uh, that uh, tries to have an offensive approach. Right now, I don't think that's uh, another example without, uh, except the Russian guys. So 
uh, if you have in mind something like this, uh, go ahead. And some resources. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll uh, go for lunch and we'll meet again.